Good afternoon, New York, and the rest of our listeners around the globe. My name is June Stoyer, and I'm the host of the Organic View Radio Show. Our podcast is available on iTunes, Zoom, and all major podcast providers. So if you can't catch the show live, you can download it or simply use our free podcast player, which is available on our website at www.theorganicview.com. If you'd like to connect with us, please post a question on our wall on Facebook or send me a tweet at June Stoyer on Twitter. If you'd like to be on the show or would like to find out about sponsorship opportunities, please contact us at questions at theorganicview.com. Today's show is sponsored by Eden Foods, the most trusted name in certified organic clean food. Listeners of The Organic View can receive 20% off any regularly priced items, excluding cases, by simply using the coupon code ORGVIEW. That's O-R-G-V-I-E-W. For more promotional offers, please visit our website at www.theorganicview.com. Also, don't forget to check out our contest section on our website for your chance to win one of our cool prizes. For more information, please visit www.theorganicview.com forward slash contests. On today's show, Tom and I are going to talk about a few interesting topics, such as the new issue of Wings from the Xerxes Society, a new French study about neonicotinoids, and a study that was done on bee pollination in apples. So I'd like to welcome to the show my co-host, Colorado beekeeper, Tom Theobald. Good afternoon, Tom. Hello, June. And how are your bees this week? Well, it's been cold. The bees are uh, keeping warm inside the hive, so there hasn't been much flight. We had uh, some cold rain the other night, and uh, it's we're kind of into early winter. Thanks, Tom. I know many of our listeners are always interested in learning about the updates as far as how you're doing and how you're managing, especially with the winter approaching. Winter is a big question, Mark, and... Uh... We just keep our fingers crossed, do the best we can, and hope for the best. Exactly. The first topic for our program today is the new publication from the Xerxes Society. It's their fall edition of Wings. And there's a lot of really great information in here. I think it's good that the Xerxes Society is talking more about the use of neonicotinoids and why they're used. So I thought that that was very effective. However, I was curious as far as their position when it comes to the whole White House strategy. That was something that I really didn't understand because it just seems as though the White House is just buying time when the bottom line is is that they should be banning these chemicals. What are your thoughts, Tom? Well, you know, I've commented a number of times on this, and and I think it's – like uh, putting the burglars in charge of the rash of burglaries in a neighborhood. I don't mean to be overly critical, but they put the EPA and the USDA in charge of this uh, report on pollinators, and uh, they're doing everything they can to hide from the real problems because they don't want them revealed. And in, in this case, what we've been talking about is the neonicotinoids, and uh, they have very carefully tried to dis- steer the discussion away from that whenever that subject arises because they don't want it revealed just how massive their failures have been. And, and we've talked about it in every way possible, and we'll we'll discuss some of the studies, recent studies, this afternoon. Uh, I think the uh, presidential task force has been... Uh, diverted into unproductive uh, proposals. Well, it's the second announcement from the White House, and that came, what, back in May, Tom? Boy, I'm not sure. So much of this stuff begins to run together. Now, Tom, this was the second effort by the White House. Could you refresh our listeners' memories as far as what the result of that was? Well, once again, let me think for a minute. The answer would be nothing. They haven't done anything. One of their major platforms is the uh, habitat improvement. They've carefully avoided assessing what the quality of that habitat may be, and the mounting evidence is that the environment has been widely poisoned at damaging levels, and 
the habitat will not be an improvement. Well, Tom, let's take a moment and review some of their go-to points that they like to throw at the bee health advocates as well as the environmentalists. So one of them is in increasing and improving foraging, which is a great idea. But when you take a look at the film More Than Honey and they show the section about China, that's when it becomes problematic. Well, China had used pesticides so excessively in some of their regions that there were no bees and the growers had to resort to hand pollination. Now, you can only do this when you have unlimited manpower and a relatively small task at hand. There is no way that we could begin to do any kind of reasonable hand pollination here in the United States. Well, the bottom line is is that they keep talking about this, and yeah, that's what it boils down to. When the environment is so toxic that the bees cannot thrive, there is no point. We don't have the manpower or even the ability to collect and distribute the pollen in the time that it would take in order to replace the amount of crops that are pollinated by bees naturally. So just the whole idea is just preposterous. But this is one of their go-tos. That's the point of bringing this up. Then the second go-to is, you know when industry is pushing something, when you see the reference to the Cutler-Dupree study, such as the case with this new paper that's titled Reconciling Laboratory and Field Assessments of Neonicotinoid Toxicity to Honeybees. And this was just published just a few days ago. Once again, this particular study, or they make it a point, rather, to reference the Cutler-Dupree study. Well, this is, this is evidence of what's been going on for a long, long time. The industry keeps saying that they want science-based decisions made, and they introduce junk science into the, to the discussion. And the Cutler-Dupree study is perhaps the classic example. It's fourth-grade science. Anybody, any reputable scientist would be embarrassed to put their name on that. And any reputable scientist would be embarrassed to cite that study. And the study, that, the paper that you're talking about, June, cites not only the original Cutler-Dupree study, but the million-dollar rep replication of that study. And uh, that's equally worthless, even though it costs them nearly a million dollars. One of the fundamental problems with the second uh, Scott-Dupree study was that the controls were contaminated. They couldn't even find an area that would be free of the nicotinoids, neonicotinoids. And the same thing happened with Helen Thompson in the UK. They've tried to explain this away uh, weekly, but any reputable scientist looking at what's being done would be embarrassed. They're, they are embarrassed. They're embarrassed by these people who represent themselves as scientists. This is industry-generated junk science. And the interesting thing is that they still are harping on their claim that there isn't enough science, even though there are how many hundreds of studies that prove the impact of neonicotinoids not only on honeybees, but many other pollinators. The, uh, the Worldwide Task Force on the Assessment of Neonicotinoids reviewed over 1,100 studies. There is more than enough science. There will never be enough science. They will always try to raise that issue. Um, there never will be enough science. The science is overwhelmingly condemning this family of pesticides. And, and you mentioned other pollinators. That's a good uh, indicator of what the damages have been. We talked about it a little last week with the study that was done, the paper that was done in northeastern Colorado. Industry would like to uh, explain all this as uh, varroa mite. <clears throat> it's the varroa mite that is causing the problems, but the varroa mite does not affect the bumblebees or the 
solitary bees, the native pollinators, and they are having substantial losses as well. And those losses are from these neonicotinoids. It's clear. It's as clear as can be. Industry makes a practice in the business world of doing what they call externalizing their costs. And in this situation, what they have done is they have profited by externally externalizing their costs to the environment. You and I are paying the price in the deterioration of the environment so that these chemical companies can make billions of dollars on these chemicals and they may not even be effective. We're seeing more and more studies that are showing that the seed treatment, which is the major use, is probably not having a positive effect on yields of corn or soybeans, the two major uses. And in the case of soybeans, there is a strong evidence that it may be having, an, having a damaging effect. It, uh, the seeds treated with neonicotinoids are killing off a predator of slugs. The slugs now become a problem for the soybeans. And the seed treatment with neonicotinoids actually results in a 5% decrease in yields. Now, I don't think the foliar applications are much better. There's an article that appeared in the Globe and Mail, and it's titled Exposure Bees to Neonics Linked to Poor Apple Crops. And this was published on the 18th of November. Let's see, it says, the study, co-authored by University of Guelph professor Nigel Rain, found exposure to real-world doses of the widely used class of insecticide known as neonicotinoids caused bees to visit flowers less often and collect less pollen, and resulted in an apple crop that had up to 36% fewer seeds, a key measure of a crop's health. The trees visited by the 24 colonies of bumblebees in the British study were also more likely to drop their fruit prematurely, according to the study released on Wednesday. What, what that means, and apple growers would know this, are people who are familiar with the apples, but I believe the apple has five lobes, and each of those lobes must be pollinated. Now, if you're seeing a significant decline in the number of seeds, if the seeds are not fully pollinated in a lobe of an apple, then you get a, an off-center apple. You get That lobe will not develop fully, and you get a deformed apple. We see the same thing in cucumbers. Cucumbers re require, I believe, 14 individual visits during the course of, of a day when that flower is open. And the, uh, the cucumber has a number of these lobes, and each one of those has to be pollinated. And I'm sure gardeners have seen this. If you get a cucumber that has a constricted part, a narrow waist, or the end is, is smaller than the rest, that's an indication of inadequate pollination. What they did was they fed the bees uh, syrup laced with neonicotinoids at field-relevant levels, and they were less effective at pollinating. And this confirms something that beekeepers have been saying for a long time. It's like a mother with a child. That mother can recognize that that child is, is not feeling well or has something bothering it or is, is ill in some way. And beekeepers observe their bees almost daily. And one of the things that they have described is the failure to thrive. They may not have the science right at their fingertips, but they can see that that colony of bees is not healthy, is not vigorous, is not thriving. Now, I just want to add something to that. I remember when we used to buy watermelons at the supermarket and you would see the seeds. Some of the seeds were brown, dark brown, and some of the seeds were white. And that was a, a very big indication that the plant had not been properly pollinated. And that used to be something that was commonly talked about especially amongst the watermelon connoisseurs. But your point is, is that it will have an effect on the crop as a whole. And, you know, these are little things that people who are either foodies or farmers will know. But the bottom line is, is that it's 
a problem, period, not only for the beekeepers, but for the farmers. And I also want to add a comment that was included in this article. It says, Professor Cola, who was not involved in the study, called the results important, but said it came as no shock that neonics are reducing crop yields and the effectiveness of pollinators, given the number of studies on the negative effects of neonics on the bees themselves. Well, so isn't that interesting? This is a major problem, and it only grows every year. And the regulators in the USDA are running away from the realities of this problem. You know, I think all of us, most of us, are operating under the assumption that we have a system that fundamentally works, and all we have to do is be eloquent and bring these failures to their attention, and the system will correct itself. More and more, I believe that that simply is not the case. We don't have a system that is functioning. We have a system that is a criminal enterprise, in effect. It, it is not stepping up to its responsibilities. It's controlled by the corporations, and there need to be some major changes made if there's any hope of stemming these environmental damages, and the damages are enormous. The bottom line is, is that when it comes to the crops, now they're starting to see more hardcore results. They keep saying that there isn't enough science, which there is and has been proven by so many different world-renowned scientists. At this particular point, Tom, now that the growers are experiencing this, how much longer do you think the government will allow this to go on before they actually do something? Because this is a threat to food security at this point, which is a threat to national security. I think it's going to take some substantial crop losses before there's any recognition on the part of the growers that they've been misled. I don't think the EPA and the USDA is going to change because they're they're working from what is basically an industry script. The EPA in particular is not protecting the environment nor protecting the people. And we talked a little bit about that last week when we discussed sulfoxiflor situation where the EPA has responded to the court order to remove the registration from vacate the registration sulfoxiflor and they're doing everything they can to satisfy the interests of the corporations at the risk of the environment they've said that any of the sulfoxiflor that's out there in the hands of users can be used that's just irresponsible in my view and and should not be allowed and i'm hoping that somebody has some courage and steps into the driver's seat and begins to demand that the EPA carry out its responsibilities under the law the way it should. Thanks, Tom. The last thing that I'd like to talk about is in regards to Monsanto's possible takeover of Syngenta. This is huge. If Monsanto acquires Syngenta, not only is that going to give them a huge increase of market share, but it's going to make them, I don't even know if there's such a word, <laughs> a mega monster, I guess? Well, you know, in the past, we would have called this a, a, a trust. We have antitrust laws. They're going unenforced. The government doesn't have the courage to exercise their responsibilities. We've already seen tremendous concentration in the industry. One of the best examples is the seed industry. The chemical companies bought up the seed business. They now have control of the seed, and that's why it's almost impossible for corn farmers to get seed that isn't treated. Um, this is a situation that's gone completely out of control. We have no government. The government is under the control of these corporations, and there have to be some changes. We have to see some people in government with the courage to step up to these challenges, or we are going to have tremendous environmental damages. We already are having them. 
Well, it'll be interesting to see who winds up acquiring Syngenta. Apparently, there are a number of companies that are very powerful and very wealthy that would like to acquire Syngenta, but you now who winds up with Syngenta remains to be seen. At this point, uh, Syngenta doesn't seem to be interested, but maybe the price is just isn't high enough. Well, that's not necessarily the case because, according to the Wall Street Journal, they've reported that Syngenta has been talking to DuPont about merging with its agricultural unit. This industry basically is in a position where they can inflict a lot of damage to the world population. But once again, it remains to be seen. Well, you know, we're, we're one of the few outlets that is talking about these things. And uh, we have to have more people that come to understand the intricacies of these arguments and begin to speak out. This has gone far too far already, and the environmental damage has already be, been enormous. We're finding these neonicotinoids everywhere we look. We're finding them in the water. We're finding them in non-target plants. We're finding them in the soil. It just astounds me that there's not more sense being applied to this situation. Well, you have a number of organizations that should be taking the front-line position, they should really be doing everything possible to protect the species that they were formed to advocate to protect. And that's something, folks, that you should consider this year, especially when all of these NGOs and different nonprofit groups are reaching out for your, your money. Think about what they've done. Think about who they are taking support from. And if they're taking support, and what I mean by support, if they're, if they're accepting large donations from companies that are fighting against GMO labeling or are working directly with companies like Monsanto, Bayer, Dow, Syngenta, just think about the consequences because, in essence, you're basically supporting part of what you're fighting against. One of the strategies of the corporations is to create what seem to be positively oriented commissions and committees and cooperatives, and, and it's intended to divert a lot of the energy of their opposition and give the appearance of concern when really there is none. And, and I, as you say, June, I think that people need to take a look at where the support for many of these organizations comes from. We have some very good ones and very legitimate and very hardworking. We also have some that, that well-intentioned people are participating with naively that have been created by the corporations to confuse the issue, to divert the energy, to keep people occupied, to drag things out. So it's important for people to understand where the funding is coming from for these organizations and dig a little deeper and begin to understand some of the things that unfortunately we've been forced to learn over the years. It's not a pretty picture. No, it certainly isn't. And folks, as a reminder, Thanksgiving in America is approaching rapidly. And as you do your shopping for your family get together or if you're just celebrating by yourself with friends, what have you, just remember one out of three bites is courtesy of the bees. So when you think about the issues that Tom and I talk about each week, keep that in mind because it'll be a much different world if we don't have honeybees to pollinate the crops that we depend upon. Much of what would be on your Thanksgiving table would be absent. Someone sent me recently, and I unfortunately don't remember who, but it was an illustration of what a McDonald's hamburger would be like without the products that require pollinators, honeybees and other pollinators. Well, you could take out the lettuce, and you could take out the onions, and you could take out the hamburger, and the point they were making was what you would have if you took away the pollinators is the McBun. Wheat is wind pollinated, doesn't need the insect pollinators, so what you would have is you would have a bun. 
Well, Tom, to be continued, thanks for joining me today. Well, every week is interesting, June, and, and there's always something new. We need more people on our side. We need more people to do more than just listen. They need to do their homework. They need to become involved. They need to become much more concerned than they have been. If you have any comments, please, by all means, you can send me a tweet at June Stoyer on Twitter, or you can write to us. The email address is questions at theorganicview.com. Tune in next week as we continue. Thank you for tuning in. This has been June Stoyer with the Organic View Radio Show. Have a great afternoon, folks.